Welcome everybody to the IDF debates titled Building Blocks. Um, this is basically a, a series of conversations that we've been wanting to do for a while, Rajshri and me. Uh, Rajshri is a founder of uh, India Design Forums and I'm Renata Nigadiok. I'm an architect, writer and researcher. And together, together we've curated this series where um, we're basically trying to highlight certain issues or certain concerns within the architecture community and have people and professionals come together and discuss them in an open and candid format. Um, this started off as a conversation between Rajshri and me and today we're very happy to welcome you all to the second um, well, session of uh, Building Blocks. The first one was a big success where we were talking about what is good architecture. And today we hope to talk about the business of architecture. It is a vast subject, but we've got a very um, interesting panel with us today and we're hoping to find some answers and some direction as to what architecture could be, architecture is with respect to economies and with respect to the business that it is. Um, so Rajshri, if you'd like to add something. Um, hello everyone. I hope you're all keeping safe and sane uh, during these very uh, challenging times. Before the year ends, uh, we decided to put this together from IDF. We'd love to have had one of our mega conferences with all the buzz and energy, but we are glad you're all here to, um, to uh, put this online energy into these sessions. Um, what's been most important for us is to really establish this forum as a space to have an open and honest conversation about uh, the subject. Uh, architecture has, um, uh, is very vital, very important, and the premier building block for a country's uh, um, economy in more ways than one. And, um, you know, we've got an amazing um, set of uh, architects from all over, actually, over the next um, three weeks uh, to talk. And uh, today we are talking about the business of architecture. I often hear from architects that, um, you know, the business of architecture was never one of the subjects that was discussed in architecture school. And uh, that's a question that um, I'd like um, all our panelists today to talk about as well. And um, really, um, uh, you know, when an architect joins um, uh, a firm, does he really think about the uh, other jobs he needs to do to get uh, the firm to be successful and sustainable over a period of time? Um, lots of questions and also what's the difference between a, a studio and a firm uh, and a corporate. So we've got diverse set of people here. So, and wonderful people. Thank you all for being with us, Akshat, Smita, Sanjay, and, um, you know, um, wonderful people. Um, Smita joined us at 4.30 in the morning from California and um, Akshat in Delhi, Sanjay is in Mumbai. And um, Rinal and I are delighted to um, now uh, introduce all of them. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rajshri. Thank so you. I'm just, without we uh, spending too much more time, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, I'm going to start with Sanjay, who's in Bombay, uh, who founded his eponymous <laughs> firm in 1992, which now stands at a strength of 72. Um, and listed among leading architects worldwide by organizations such as Arc Daily and Architizer. Sanjay Puri Architects has received more awards than one can keep track of, be it the WAC, World Architecture Festival, The Plan, LEAF, and 250 others that include 160 international awards and over 100 national awards. The practice has won architectural projects in Spain, Montenegro, Mauritius, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Montreal, Oman, Dallas, and 40 other Indian cities with diverse portfolio of townships, schools, hotels, retail, and office buildings, they continue their quest for creating innovative design solutions that are sustainable on a large scale. Their focus lies in evolving design solutions that are contextual and creating spaces that revolutionize the way they are experienced from the essence of the firm's design philosophy. Sanjay, it's an honor to have you here and it's such a pleasure to welcome you. Um, We've kind of, we've had our own experiences over the years, but it's really interesting to be talking to you about the business of architecture today. So welcome. Thank you very much, Vrindavani. Thank you. So, um, uh, Smita Gupta is the Director of India Operations at Gensler. She is responsible for project management within the country and coordinates between Gensler's uh, partners in India and its teams in the US. Gensler's global team reimagines the future of cities 
as unprecedented challenges drive us towards a critical time of transformation is what they say. And Gensler's purpose is to create a better world through the power of design. I love that. Um, and comes to life across 26 practice areas, client relationships, global network of leaders and diversity of talent. And Smitha offers a highly um, uh, valued combination of experience in strategic planning, workplace design and building architecture. And uh, by working closely with clients and designers to integrate project goals through the design and documentation process, Smita has developed a holistic approach to project understanding and delivery. Thank you, Smita, for joining us. Thank you. And <clears throat> we've got um, Akshat Bhatt, who is the principal architect at Architecture Discipline, um, which is a New Delhi-based multidisciplinary design practice that was founded in 2007. His work spanning varied typologies from residential <clears throat> and retail interiors to large scale public and commercial assignments, which is also spread across the length and breadth of India. <coughs> Sorry. Um, these highlight the emergence of an architectural expression that is contemporary yet rooted in a critical understanding of regionalism. Notable projects include a town hall and sales office for the Bhartia city township in Bangalore, ongoing refurbishment projects for the Oberoi Group's properties in Agra and Kolkata, and the JDH Urban Regeneration Project, which aims to restore the historic walled city of Jodhpur to its former glory. Akshat also represented India on the global front with the Make in India Pavilion at Hanover in 2015, which was a Judd the best pavilion in the 65 year history of the Messe. His work is published extensively and has won many accolades, in including the NDTV DAA awards and citations from the Alliance Francaise and the government of India. Again, a pleasure to have you with us, Akshat. Um, it's interesting, we were just talking a minute ago, Akshat was my first employee, employer, sorry, and I was his first employee. And uh, about close to 20 years later, we've got you and we are talking about how you've gone from a small little office in the garage of a, an LIG housing uh, community to now having your own big setup in a posh colony in Delhi. So um, if I can ask you to just kind of map your journey, tell us how you've come to this point. And uh, if we can start the conversation by each one of you telling us what you've kind of experienced over the years from the time that you graduated and, you, and you've now established yourself as practitioners and we can take the conversation from there. So if Akshad, if you'd like to start. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I, I came back, uh, you know, from my studies in the UK and having worked there for a while in 2001. And, you know, it was right after the Millennium Commission uh, project. So uh, we were, you know, architecture at that time was everyday conversation. Uh, so people were talking about how the Millennium Bridge was swaying. I mean, Foston Park was, was sort of embroiled in two controversies. One was the Millennium Bridge and how it was shaking. And the other was mm -hmm. uh, how the walls of the British Museum were too white. The, library, the British Museum Library Extension were too white. Um, and of course, there were many others. So, uh, you know, and in those days, people didn't have mobile phones and they weren't always plugged in. So there was a lot of conversation in the tubes about what is going on in the city. It, it sort of got me hooked. I think, you know, when you start having, uh, when architecture becomes everyday conversation amongst uh, people in a city, it just, it just takes on a different life and a different meaning. Uh, so when I came back, I came back with, you know, this ambition to, um, to sort of, address architecture through my, uh, you know, through what was sort of uh, my understanding of it, which was firmly rooted in the idea of British high tech, because those are, the, those are the guys that I was inspired by and the ones that I followed. Um, and also understanding that architecture goes beyond just architectonics, it also goes into the space in between. And that's, it's the space in between buildings where cities happen. And I mean, I always thought there was tremendous potential for that in India. So I came back and I started working for a few practices. Um, I was junior partner uh, with uh, in a practice where the principal was within and he was, I think 25 years older than I am. I've just given away with his age. <laughs> but, uh, um, and uh, well, after working together for a few years, uh, we, I realized that, um, you know, I had a lot of things to say and, um, and it was probably better if I said them on my own and, and, and uh, not sort of uh, either dilute someone else's statements or not dilute mine. Um, and 
uh, well, before I did that, I started looking for a moderate or large scale practice that was an equal opportunity practice in India, mm-hmm. which I didn't find. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and also after after a while looking, um, architecture discipline just kind of happened. And um, it, it happened as a fait accompli because we, we didn't find anyone else. I had learned, I think from, I was reluctant to start because I'd learned from my earlier days that, you know, while, you know, an architectural creative journey is is an intense and fun one, one that we are groomed for, the journey of an entrepreneur is not one that I would wish upon anyone. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, well, I think I think it, it's 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 a fairly. I think to begin with, I mean, look, uh, let's put it another way that you know when I started in two thousand seven, and even before that, when you know I was pretty much running a practice. So the, it, the architecture wasn't as streamlined and structured as it is today. I think it's either streamlined and structured today, or we're just a part of a different world that is a lot more streamlined and structured and respectful, right? So the the and you, if you if you if you start referencing this the world over, you know, even if you go to YouTube and start searching for people talking about how to start an architecture practice, you'll see how difficult that journey is because the the, the barometer for success of good architecture is not money, you know, is not the business of architecture. I mean, and again, like when you, I think this this the 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 title of this talk, the business of architecture, is a double entendre because architecture has a, has a business side to it. Mm-hmm. And architecture has something that it has to do as a business, a function to perform, right? So yeah. I look at it as that. And, um, and we and will I, be and talking think, about both of them. We would yeah. like to kind of address both these issues as mm-hmm. the conversation goes ahead. Uh, so, I, I, so, you know, you know from the entrepreneurial journey that the success rate is low. Uh, and uh, I think that the issue with India is that you're the... Um, the entry barrier is actually quite easy, you know, because we have a fairly large audience and we have a diverse, uh, um, uh, a diverse mm-hmm. audience that we can address. So the the benchmarks for starting out are not as difficult. Um, so it's it's very easy to sort of within your first couple of years start out and get somewhere, but it's very hard to then get beyond that to a more meaningful scale in architecture, where you're really contributing. Mm. Uh, and I think, yeah, uh, I think I think that it can be seen in the, you know, especially with now with a lot of visual references available easily, which weren't in my time, and probably weren't. Uh, yeah, well, I don't want to say anything else, but sure they weren't really. It was difficult to find in my time. I was going to take a jab at Sanjay, but <laughs> they were they were, uh, they were they were hard. Like we had to write mails and letters to people and get physical. Uh, photocopy documents to sort of look at drawings and reference buildings and you know proportioning systems and construction details and whatnot, which also gave us a sense of rigor. Uh, but I think what you can see now is there is definitely a better visual presence for the for interior architecture in our space and maybe a little bit for architecture that happens between beyond within a boundary wall, but not what happens beyond it. So let me bring in Smita over here because Smita, you're, you're doing a lot of um, interior work, especially, right? Gensler is doing a lot of that work. But tell us a little bit about how you kind of reached Gensler and your journey with them for over two decades. Sure thing. And it's, you know, there's so many cues in what Akshat's been saying. We are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Not that we didn't, our start was the same thing as you, Akshat. It was Art Gensler, our founder, uh, meeting um, the founder of Gap on a beach and uh, he needed an architect. He had a two person shop. He sent the second person over to help uh, the founder of uh, Gap and we've uh, been working with Gap ever since. So we are over 55 years old now and we are 5,500 people. Somehow we are in, in the fives in the year 2020. And so how do you go, the idea of scale, how do you go from a two person practice? The uh, second person, the third person was the office manager was Art's wife and that's how the firm started. But here we are at 5,500, how have we been able to scale? And this is, we don't have any engineers, this is all design professionals. Um, So how do you do that? It's been a journey and you're right. I think Art was more of an entrepreneur maybe than he was an architect. Although he was a very 
a good architect. He, he'd been trained, so he had a very good eye, but he was, I think, even a better businessman. So I think you're right. The entrepreneurship uh, piece is not taught and sometimes it comes from within. So let's go, go back to my journey. I um, actually come from a business family and the, uh, you know, how it is when you fall in love, you uh, have absolutely, it doesn't have to make sense. And that was me in architecture. Um, and, you know, some, it's so uh, cliched, but some of it was Ayn Rand, who I completely deplore now. But at the time I did read Fountainhead when I was 12 and somehow that sowed the seed for architecture. And I lived in Jaipur, that really helped because I was surrounded by architecture. It, it uh, actually colors your life. And if you have any sensitivity to it, even small things matter. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was, you know, all those things were coming together. Uh, I had some friends whose uh, fathers were architects. So I saw that side of that life uh, of an architect. Uh, and, uh, you know, I persuaded my parents to let me think about architecture. I started actually at JJ in Bombay and went only for a month. So this is the other side that comes in and uh, that I got a scholarship to study computer information systems. And this is a long time ago. If I give you the date, I will date myself completely, but this is back in mid, the mid 80s. Uh, and that was an up and uh, developing field and we didn't know exactly what that meant. So I came to the States to study com computer information systems. Um, and, and I'm telling the story with a point, but the love, the, uh, the first love for architecture actually read its head again. I finished my bachelor's and then in the US it's possible to get to switch and get a master's in architecture. They call it a first professional degree. It takes a bit longer, three and a half, four years to get uh, your master's in architecture, which I uh, uh, went on to do. And I really felt like I had found my home. I um, The 360 degree education, if I say nothing, there's a lot of young people on the call. I say the, the education of architecture, I would wish that on everybody because it teaches you systems thinking. I had systems thinking from my computer days as well, but architect, the design thinking that I learned uh, in my four years. So all of these streams sort of came together. And in some ways I, I practiced in um, uh, Chicago for a while, but at uh, Gensler, I really found the right home for me because it, uh, it uh, absorbed all the parts of the way, um, uh, the way I thought, because it wasn't just design, and uh, but uh, the business piece that comes from my family that being an entrepreneur is just natural to me. And then uh, the systems thinking that I learned at, uh, with computers, uh, the four years that I studied um, um, information systems, that all just came together really nicely at Gensler. And we were encouraged to bring our whole self to work, which we still do. And uh, there was a uh, there was a way to do that. So I, uh, you know, at Gensler for five years, I was doing just interiors, and uh, that was great because in Chicago I was doing core and shell. Uh, then I learned how to do interiors, which is a slightly different discipline. Even how you dimension drawings is different in interiors, which Akshat and Sanjay will um, tell. And I, I'm hoping that some of the this is a, a architectural uh, audience, and they'll understand what I'm talking about. And then I, I realized that. I am solving problems that I don't know who has defined the problem. This is my systems thinking coming in. So there was a discipline called uh, consulting and strategy within Gensler. And I, I just saw that and I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't want to solve problems that I don't know uh, what has been the, uh, the brief, how has the brief come about? So I switched to consulting and strategy within Gensler, and that was basically studying the client, their organization, uh, their portfolios of uh, real estate, and uh, solving, uh, defining the brief, challenging the client on what they thought their problem was, and uh, defining the brief so the, the designers could solve it. And that really is, uh, you know, where, uh, where everything comes together for me, all the uh, design thinking, good architecture is not precluded by defining the brief correctly, which uh, Akshat and Sanjay will both um, uh, attest to, but you're actually solving the right problem. So uh, that said, you know, Gensler is a business architect, 
they are business architects. We are the largest design firm in the world. And we've been able to do it because we believe for any design problem, our client is a partner. It's because if we do not solve their issue, what, and we have to get to the bottom of that issue, then we have not done our job right. Design, uh, bringing the right design, bringing the right techniques, that is a given, that is our base. But you have to understand the issue that will make the client successful. If we are solving for retail, we need to understand all the whole uh, business for the client and solve it in a 360 de a degree fashion. Um, Renanali, you mentioned we've been doing a lot of interiors. Yes, um, a lot of our business is, is that. So uh, this is a really interesting fact. This is um, uh, uh, Art Gensler in 1965, uh, the Embarcadero, which is a big office complex mm -hmm. was being built in San Francisco at the time. And, you know, he just had this, he was a young man and he had this um, epiphany that at the time, the interiors of these buildings were just, uh, the, it was an office complex, uh, was designed by secretaries and um, wives of bosses. And he's like, well, this building is getting built. It's going to be around for 100 years, but the interiors will have to be redone every five years or something like that. He's like, that's the business I want to be in. And he didn't come to it by chance. He'd been working with Bank of America and uh, he so basically invented uh, or thought about or gave discipline to the idea of uh, workplace interiors. And so the firm is, uh, you know, deeply rooted in that. That is just the start between that and retail. But now we do everything. As you mentioned, Rajshri, we have uh, 26 practice areas and that goes all the way from urban planning to aviation, uh, to brand design. So, you know, architecture certainly and uh, interiors. And then also we do brand design and graphic design. So we, we like to say, you know, from the Shanghai Tower, second tallest building in the world, to a wine label bottle, a, a six by six uh, wine label uh, bottle. The scale is immense, 5,500 people. How do you keep all these people together is really interesting. So I, I like to uh, look at uh, Gensler as if you have uh, read the book Moneyball, Michael Lewis's Moneyball, it's about finding niche players and giving everybody, celebrating their niche um, expertise and herding all these cats together and uh, making sure that they can shine in their little niche um, development. So everybody doesn't have to do everything. So to answer your question, uh, to, to your uh, issue, Akshat, we didn't learn entrepreneurship, but there are people who are really good at entrepreneurship and understand design. How do you partner them with people who have no idea how to run the business, but are excellent designers? And basically, Gensler is built on that platform. And, uh, you know, there are some guiding principles, etc. So uh, my journey has now become entangled with uh, Gensler. I've just been there for long enough, even though I left for five years to go uh, do the strategy and consulting from the client side, which was an incredible uh, opportunity. Uh, I was responsible for, uh, I was part of a team responsible for developing the capital plan for Genentech, which is a, um, you know, very strange career. It's a biotech firm, one of the um, old, the oldest biotech firm. And how do you uh, understand science well enough to understand what they will need in terms of facilities in 10 years? But it was an incredible journey because I built almost over 2 million square feet worth $2 billion in five years because we had an incredible run of uh, biological success. So bringing all that back then back to uh, um, establishing an India practice uh, for Gensler, it's uh, really been an amazing journey, but it's been almost... Uh, more business uh, than opposite to Akshat than design for me personally. But it's business and strategy that uh, helps me to engage with amazing synthetic minds. So I find that I'm a much more analytical brain. Uh, I know what I can figure out what needs to be done. I can see when it's not done right but I need partners to do the synthesis. And so, um, you know, recognizing that um, 
uh, I can do, I'm only part of the problem has been um, amazing. It's been a successful, uh, it's been the driver for my success. Because but then we're going to come, we are, we are going to come back to you back. because yes, you yes, covered a absolutely. lot of uh, things in, you know, yes. and it's been, wow, it's been overwhelming to listen to you. you sorry, perhaps, sorry. Uh, no, 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 we're, we're delighted. We just want to split up so the audience can get, you know, um, information from everyone and collate it and then, you Absolutely. know, get what they want. Absolutely. But it's been amazing. And perhaps you are at a unique position in that, that you already came from a background of business and then you went into this corporate uh, situation, which kind of strained your, your progress further in your career. Um, Sanjay, um, um, adding to this, um, 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 so... Um, my question is, can you be an effective uh, architect without uh, the basic understanding of the business and architecture? What has been your journey? Hey, to be very, very frank, I am a very, very bad businessman. I am really, really bad. And uh, this profession is such you know, that it's, it's just so purely passion driven that there are times when the project sounds so exciting. It could be a tiny house somewhere, but that location is sitting on a contoured hill on the top, looking down at a valley. And this guy is saying, you know, I just want to make a 2,500 square feet house and you do it because I think, you know, with your profile, it looks like a tiny job. But I'm saying like, no, I really want to do it. And then, you know, fees goes aside and everything goes aside and you just get so excited by the plot and what you could do in that location that you forget everything else. So I think, you know, business-wise, architects in general are really bad and we really need to have a business partner. Still, I don't have one and I wish I found the correct person to have as a business partner because I really don't want to get into the business of things. You know, it, it's, and yet you've been highly successful, Sanjay. You couldn't have done that. You couldn't have had the growth you did and hire this amazing set of uh, young architects if you didn't know the business aspect of it as well. So I think you're underplaying that that um, that um, you know particular intelligence that you have in, in the business acumen as well. Um, now you know, um, coming back to the practice itself. Now there's so much of technology employed in uh, architecture now. Now so many digital tools. Uh, so, when you actually hiring um, uh, new recruits, are you looking for you know people with passion as yourself when you you came into the business and continue to have that passion, or are you looking um, uh, to hire people that have these digital skills? Because now everyone's working on the computers, there's every kind of software available. So, really, um, how much value is it to you know this whole? Um, um, design intelligence that necessary or the passion that is necessary anymore? I mean, how much, how, what is the percentage of um, relevance uh, that you would give to creativity in a, in a new hire? So I think, you know, even today, it's 80% is still, you're looking for the passion in the person. And it's not about all the other skills of how well you can draw and how well you know your software is. That still comes, for me, that still comes secondary. So I am still looking at 80%. Do you have the passion? And if that person has the passion, then you look at the other aspects. Okay, great. Presentation is also good. And you know, the like he's really good at Rhino or she's really good at something else. So but that, all of that is secondary. I it's completely the, second. Yeah, I completely second what you're saying, Sanjay. Yeah, I think, Although I think one should be looking at all the other aspects as well. But I don't know, somehow you just get caught up in that whole thing that is the person passionate or not. And, you know, that overrides everything else. Akshat, you were saying something? No, I, I think working in an architectural practice is like, a, is like continuing professional development throughout, right? You don't, that, that never stops. So um, we have these little one-liners for ourselves. And we always, we, when, when we're interviewing people, which I don't do anymore, uh, it's always the studio looking to see uh, if someone fits in. And for us, the, 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 how you start is by saying, you know, skills can be taught because for the first three, four, five, six months, that's what you're doing. And you're doing that as you go along. But mm -hmm. character, you either have or you don't have. Mm -hmm. So we're only looking for that. We're looking for individuals who can bring something to the studio. And that doesn't have to do with your skill set or your architectural training. It's got to do with who you are and what, what you really are as a personality. But if I, I, I could not over here, um, sorry, just to kind of continue, uh, Akshat, your sort of train of thought, 
that when you talk about personality, it's one thing to be passionate, like Sanjay said, right? You're looking for somebody who's passionate about the subject, about architecture itself. But today, like you're also saying that it's important to build a structure which can allow you to propagate your business, the business of your studio and your practice. So do you look for people who have that acumen um, who, who are like over uh, or well-rounded in that respect? Or are you looking for people who are passionate on one hand, so they're going to you know, run the design part of their studio and you're looking for another set of people who are going to run the, the business part of the studio? So I, I think, I think um, um, we are never looking for a one-dimensional person, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that these, each, each individual who's sitting in your studio is, uh, for a studio our size, we're about 25 people. So um, each person is kind of, is, a, is an ambassador for your studio itself, right? It's yeah. an energy. And um, it's a flat organization. Uh, so it's a flat outfit. It's not really an organization. Uh, unlike Jensa and possibly Sanjay who lied about his business acumen, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, um, you, uh, but, but I think we're, we're always looking for people who fit in and who contribute. Now you're not looking at it as a business development device. At least I'm not, or, or, or the studio is not. That's not what, what we're geared, geared for. And we're fortunate enough to not have to depend on it, you know, uh, really all the time. It's not our focus, uh, but it is about, uh, bringing some sort of vibe of the city in and taking our vibe out. Um, so uh, it's never the, it's never the, uh, the ambition when you first meet someone, but if they develop into being a potential person who can go out and look for new work or, or, or sort of, or identify new avenues, then that happens over the, over a couple of, uh, over a certain amount of time in the studio itself. Right. But the core, the core first engagement of the studio with an individual is that of being a designer. And That's you, kind, kind of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, um, I was just saying, Sanjay, you have previously mentioned how you, because you started off your practice, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you started off working with Hafiz contractor while you were still in school, and you continued working with him, and then after that, you kind of set off on your own with a developer who offered you a particular project. And because you started off working with a developer, you kept getting more and more projects that were developer driven. And it was a little bit of a challenge for you to come out of that little pigeonhole, right, of working with developers and doing these large scale um, sort of development projects. Whereas you have enjoyed doing smaller and more uh, different, perhaps more intimate projects as well. So was it like, can you tell us a little bit about this? I don't know if it was a struggle really, but for you to diversify your practice, and be able to do different kinds of things in the process. Oh, so yeah. So I actually started working with Hafiz when I was 18 and not even joined college then. So it was prior to joining college. So I'd already done working drawings, met clients, gone to sites, managed sites prior to going to college first year. Wow. So anyway, there's a different thing. So you were so like the why... perfect candidate for somebody to join an office. He just copied Norman Foster's life. <laughs> <laughs> After reading Fountainhead, I believe. <laughs> well, he's very smart. That's a good life to copy. So, like you said, you know, going into that, uh, so my first project was really a very large project. I mean, there's projects like that to start your office with. It was 3,000 apartments, 54 acres, apartments, school, everything, the works. And we were doing the entire urban planning as well. So, I mean, that's like, that was a huge break. So yes, but because of that break, the downside was that we just kept getting developer after developer after developer. There was literally a point where uh, I was doing projects in every Western suburb of Mumbai and for every single builder who was building there. And, you know, that effort to try to, you know, get something different was just not happening because people never considered it that way. They said, oh, this guy is for, you know, the developer kind of architect. So it just, oh, it took a long time to get that first break. We did a very interesting food court in Lonavla. And then uh, we won a competition to do a leisure center, which was just a 15,000 square feet building, but it was very, very interesting in the Ambi Valley, which is like a three hour drive from Bombay. And so slowly, slowly the shift happened. And then we started focusing on trying to get those jobs. So it took a long period. So we are still doing developer projects now also. But that is now only 30% of our actual work. 
the rest of the work, which involves schools and houses and all other kinds of buildings. So yeah, it took a long time, I and mean, it took a really long time. It was a struggle. With that, you know, you're you're doing a lot of different works now, a lot of diverse projects now. So it's it's paid off, right? Yes, it did. <laughs> Rajin. You know what? Um, what? Um, what was very intriguing for me was listening to Smita talk about Gensler's. You know, um, large. I mean, they're a large corporate today, and uh, you know, she said they're even coming down to designing a label. So they really, they are a design company. This, I mean, from her conversation, it seems that far more a design company as an identity than an architecture firm. And 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 she also said they hire designers and not architects. Now. You know, I mean, it's very different from the way um, Akshat and Sanjay and other, you know, Indian architecture firms work because you actually are hiring architectural graduates with engineering degrees and so on. So um, how different is how different is the environment that you work in? How different is, um, you know, how uh, is the perception of an architecture firm in India? Akshat, um, and and Smita, you also work out of India six months yeah. a year. You know, so, so I'll just say that Gensler would be appalled if they heard that they were being called a corporate. <laughs> and, oh. and frankly, I have worked for a corporation and they are not corporate. They are definitely a design firm. They're made up of small studios and it's it's really organic. They would be appalled. Yes, there is a framework. We call it the platform. Um, that everybody can plug into, but they, they are, uh, I guess they are a little bit more corporate than uh, perhaps the smaller firms, but frankly, they are primarily a design firm. And I would say a majority of the people are trained architects and interior designers. And then there are others who join as well, you know, other adjacent uh, fields as well. So over to Aksha. I, well, I think what I understand is that you guys scale beyond a point and then you bring it, there is diversity that comes in either organically yes. or it's sort of doctored in. And, um, and uh, it's a bit like looking at a fashion house, right? Where, where the chief fashion designer, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of machinery that's actually looking after the business end of that, of that, of that design studio allowing the designers to be independent. So I, I, I think there was a time then one would look down upon a large scale firm or organization as say, oh, well, they're not innovative or creative enough or, you know, uh, sort of, um, or, 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 or outfit like enough or sort of, you know, hands on enough. But that's been proven wrong over the last couple of decades, clearly. I mean, and I think it was really because in the, even in the eighties, uh, you know, a good studio was at the most 35 people studio. But today, when you look at a Foster and Partners or a Bjark Engels or, 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 you know, or Gensler, you know, these guys are behemoths and uh, they are running delivery structures, but that doesn't just mean that they are stuck in that. Yes, you will see a lot of output, which is a certain kind. And you can say, well, it's just output. But if you look at all the smaller studios do, generating work, you'll see that there is that sort of similarity anyway. The, 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 the space for innovation and true innovation is uh, and and true contribution through design is limited. You can't, you can sometimes just overdo it and sort of have an academic contribution of some level, uh, which which is or or esoteric contribution. But 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 I think um, I think I've grown to appreciate how large studios tend to or large organizations and large studios tend to work. Um, there's think- a lot to learn there. What's happening is that the minute a studio goes beyond a certain scale, it's termed commercial, right? And I don't necessarily understand why. So today, uh, the perception is that if you are a large scale studio, you're commercial. And the minute you're termed commercial, you're termed less creative. Is that something that you all feel? Not at all. And, you know, I I would like to address that because that is something that we face all the time Mm. and talk about passion projects. Uh, The first time I came to Bangalore, I drove by the Opera House. It was a derelict building. It was sitting over there, uh, you know, completely uh, boarded up. Uh, Ten years down the road, Samsung actually rented that building and we had a chance to work on that. Sanjay, we made no money on it, but it was a passion project that we did. Uh, in Bangalore, and it adds so much to the city. So the passion doesn't go out. 
uh, Akshat, I, you know, I was going to say to you, I'm so sorry that we were not there uh, when you were looking for an outfit like ours to plug into because we were the right place for you because we want to harness your passion and give, give you all the other support to do your best work. And so, and not at all. I, I just don't like this idea of commercial. If commercial means that we uh, do well by doing good, then yes, we want to be commercial, but uh, the passion doesn't uh, it is not reduced by even an iota. Yeah, I, th I think I think we have to somehow start disassociating commercial success from poor work, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. would you would you judge? Exactly. Of, I mean, if you if you Google Foster and Partners, it's the number one place to work, and it's the number one studio uh, one one of, and it's the number one studio in in the architectural communities. Uh, you know, in terms of respect. So why? Would you say that? Like, how could we, how can, they've proven it. Like, is there enough other Richard Rogers partnership, 700 people, right? So we, uh, I, I think we tend, to, often we tend to sort of do that to shield ourselves, to say no, you know, to sort of put blinkers on ourselves, you know, in a, in a sort of almost a socialist way. I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but almost to sort of say that, hey, you know, commercial success is not good. Commercial success means you're compromising somewhere. No, you're not. Uh, if you're using that to harness some other kind of energy, um, then you're definitely not, and it's a, and it's a good thing. You are doing this. You are in this profession for profit, right? You're not in it as a charitable organization. You know, we have to find success for yourself. So, yeah. Sanjay, Sanjay how would you define Sanjay, success for yourself? Hmm. Do you do you feel that your practice has been successful over the years? Yes, it has been successful to an extent, but not to the extent uh, that I wanted it to be because there were a number of designs that we had done like 15 years ago, which never saw the light of day. Every day. I mean, seriously, they were at that time really ahead of time, but you know, each time it was the client said, no, this is too much. Oh, this is, you know, what? This, they were just not convinced. So I think we lost a lot of opportunity, but that it was not that we did something to lose it. It was just that it did not happen for other reasons. So it would have been way more successful. So Sanjay, are you equating your idea of success um, by the, the kind of design projects that you seem uh, to be disappointed that didn't materialize? Um, yeah. So yeah, you're, you're, you're equating your success to passion in that sense and not commerce because certainly you are commercially commercially a very successful architecture firm but you still feel this now isn't doesn't that some, have something to do with the client landscape um, in India as well um, isn't it about Absolutely. raising the bar of awareness of what is good architecture bad architecture and and um, respecting the architect and his creativity yeah yeah. Can you elaborate a bit on that, Sanjay? Yeah. It's got everything to do with that. You know, people think that, okay, you know, and I've been told this, oh, you got easy, you got this, you got that, it's so easy for you to convince clients. It's it's not at all easy. You know, the, the amount of time you spent convincing a client 15 years back, you're still doing it every, even now with every single project almost. Yeah, just those few, very few who come saying that, okay, you know, this guy has done this and he has done that, which is so different. I'll leave it to them. But that's so rare. It's like 1 in 50, 60 maybe. But the balance 49, you still need to convince, convince, convince at every point, at the design time, the budget time, for getting a good contractor, for not compromising. I think in India, if you manage to construct a project the way you emphasize it in the beginning, you should get an award for that itself. Because you have to deal with a client who changes his mind. And this is like an Indian thing, you know. They think, you know, you can keep changing. It's okay. So what? You can keep changing. And, you know, every few months you can change. Every second month you can change. And you can say, let's look at it. Let's look at it. How, how often can you do it? You are wasting your money. Don't they get it? So that's A. Then to find the correct contractor. Okay. So there are some contractors who understand. But then that client doesn't want that contractor. But maybe that contract is expensive. Or maybe that contractor is far away. Or maybe he doesn't have that manpower to do it in the same speed. So there are all these other factors. So then you have to deal with a contractor only who's not good to start with and then make sure because here in India, you have a contractor who thinks he knows it all also in spite of not having done enough work or that. Kind. So there are these challenges at every single point. Here. But Sanjay, tell me, don't you think that 
you know, with, with your ears as a, as a studio and with the kind of provenance you have, uh, while I understand every time you're doing a new typology you and you're up against your competition, you if you're sort of in a competition or if you're pitching or some such, you have to prove your worth or you have to prove the metal of your ideas. But a lot of what you're saying seems to have to do with contract administration, which is like your change logs that you're talking about are your own studios contract administration. Then when you talk about how you deal with a contract or a third party who's actually responsible for delivering your, your project in, in a physical form, then it's about, you know, helping a client project manage your contract administer. I feel often we tend to confuse in India, we tend to confuse or I feel often we tend to get overburdened by certain expectations that we shouldn't have. And that clouds our ability to, to choose the right partners or the right people to work with. No, no, Akshat, that aside, that of course is part of it. No, but the main thing is that clients yet have to be convinced to do a design that is slightly different also. I mean, they just want to do it. Oh, this is, uh, oh, it's, I mean, I'm just saying a simple thing, okay, just a few days back. Oh, this building got too many curves. The shuttering will be too expensive. Why don't you make a straighter design? You're not seeing what you're achieving by the design. You're achieving fluid. You're achieving spaces that flow into each other. They're not interested in that. They are only interested in how you can cut cost at all time. So it starts with the client problems first. You still have to spend so much time convincing a client to do what you want to do. Contract. I have, yeah. I have a question on you know the building process itself. Um, do most architects uh, firms, um, you know, bill on an hourly basis or on a project fee basis? Uh, because, you know, if what you're saying is, uh, is true, and I know it's true that, yes. uh, you know, clients keep changing and changing. So if you charge just the project fee, you're just losing out on your resources. You're losing out all the time, by the way. And although the, there is a clause that if you repeat the design, once it is frozen and you've gone to a certain stage, or if you finish the working drawing and then you change the design, the design stage will be built again, the working drawing stage will be built again. But clients in India are just not ready to pay. They're just not ready to pay. So there are very few, to be fair, there are a few who say, okay, they accept that, okay. But that also, they'll accept that, okay, I got, you, I got the design changed four times, I'll pay once more. It never happens up till now in our career. It's never happened that somebody has paid for every change in it. And we have the, you know, man hours and all of that also written in the clauses, but it is never followed. No client does. It. Smita, is Sad this something true. that you notice happening more in India as opposed to other parts of the world? No, I think it's, uh, it's an Asia-wide issue. It's not just India. We see this... Yeah, it's Asia wide. And uh, I think it's a little bit more in the West, it's a little bit more structured. And I think that's probably why, uh, because there are professionals on the client side as well. So it's not perhaps the owner himself, somebody who's doing a project for the first time, maybe they don't understand uh, this and they haven't factored uh, these kind of things in. Uh, Sanjay, we've been, you know, and that's perhaps sometimes having the, uh, uh, the heft that we do, sometimes it helps. We've been able to get some additional services for design changes, uh, but you're right. I think it's a struggle. And uh, so uh, believe me, it's not easy. The only thing we can do is to have a very uh, defined process. And then you're right. They will make the changes even when the design drawings are done and what will process do at that point. Uh, you know, I think uh, that's where making sure that the brief and the story, and this is where storytelling comes into all of this, that, that the story of the project is well established. So the changes that be that are being requested, you can at least challenge them to a certain extent. But you're right, th this issue does exist. You seem to have had a, a different sort of set of experiences. Sorry? You seem to have had a different set of experiences with Me? your clients, yeah? Um, yes, I, I think, um, I, 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 I mean, I, I understand where Sanjay is coming from and I, and I actually agree with uh, Smita as well, but I think uh, I have to say that we've been lucky that way, that we have been able to have some clarity of stage 
uh, on documentation. Uh, it is it is very hard to build man hours in India because there is a certain there is a learning curve that's happening within smaller studios all the time, and so there is no real man hour definition. Uh, there's a lot of inefficiency because we're all addicted to our mobile phones. I think a lot more than they, than we, than people are. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and th- so there was a time when I would actually I, we would actually request everyone to leave their phones on you know at the reception, and then if they received a call, the receptionist would would sort of uh, would hand the phone out or or help them out with whatever communication they had to do. So that uh, it was there, but you weren't missing out. Um, there seems to be this. So I think that mobile phone addiction is is a problem in India. But uh, but I think stage clarity is something that we have been able to achieve. It's not, and, and it has to do with the seriousness of the project, uh, mm-hmm. the clarity of the brief, of course, the clarity of the program, the critique of the program as you receive it, the understanding of the area statement as you receive it, which is a lot of those processes are short changed in studios in India because we're just so eager to get onto the drawing board and start to start sort of, re, you know, throwing out something that 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 we can innovate. We have had terrible experiences on a few projects where we wasted a lot of time just trying to prove an incorrect area statement as an ego tussle with, unfortunately, a professional on the client side, and it's it's so it works both ways. Um, I think that it has to do with a lot of contractual clarity. I have been appalled to see some one-page, two-page contracts that mm-hmm. that my colleague, my 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 colleagues have sort of shown to me from their their studios. Say, hey, this can't possibly be a professional services agreement, you know. Um, uh, so we we sort of, I think I I think I pride myself in being able to have arrived at a fair agreement that works both ways, and we we really, really, really. Uh, do not budge from it, you know, uh, unless, uh, and, and if it is budged from, then it's always done with lawyers' uh, consultation. Do you think this has something to do with the scale of the project as well, project, the scale yeah. of the client that you're working with, where, you know, you're not getting, if you're working with smaller projects or smaller clients, then you have direct points of contacts with them. Uh, whereas if you're working with big, you know, I kind of refrain, I can't <laughs> refrain from saying corporates, but you kind of get um, tangled in the bureaucracy of just the, the number of people who are involved in this whole process. Does that happen? It's work culture. I, I, think, I, think, it, it, I think at both scales, be, be it a small client or a large client, um, you know, it's work culture. So you could work with a very large developer and still get, you know, still get thrown around on your contract. Uh, it's mm-hmm. really about, so I think clarity has to begin with you. You know your cl- the clarity of what service you're going to provide, how much time you're going to spend, how how quickly do you want to deliver something, the time frame of a project. You know the the need to investigate or question the brief. I, look, we are, we're we're a, we're a younger studio, so much and 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 definitely not as large as these and as these other two sort of dates. But but we do have um, we do try and sort of put some value and take to our time so that we can. Uh, and we do allow ourselves to get pushed around a bit for the benefit of the project. We're not, it's not a, tra- you see, architecture or in design is not a transactional relationship. You know, it cannot be that, but mm. it cannot be a one way street either. And I think we, we tend to, we tend to, we, we often tend to not have the courage to walk away. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question on marketing. I mean, um, uh, isn't marketing uh, or shouldn't marketing be an essential uh, part of, of your of your business or your your company's, uh, uh, you know, to be to really how there's so many architects and architectural firms that have cropped up everywhere in India, in every city, even in tier two, tier three cities, I often see architecture, uh, you know, practices. Now, how does one go and get these um, you know, um, jobs, how, what, how do you develop and nurture a client network? How do you go on? I mean, as surely, you know, all, all of you are working, you're working on your creativity, getting these things sorted, but don't you think it's essential to have a, a, a small marketing setup within your own organizations? And maybe you do. So like building a brand? Kind <laughs> of, you know, the outreach. How do you go and get a job? How do you, how, yeah, until, until you do an amazing, um, no, un, so, until you, yeah, Sanjay. A lot, of, a lot of architecture firms in India have marketing teams. In fact, I was shocked to hear, first time when I heard about 10 years back, 
that this guy used to work in a bowling alley. And so I said, oh, you, you used to deal with that bowling company, right? So now where are you? He said, oh, I'm working with this so-and-so architect in Mumbai. So I said, uh, what are you working with an architect? You, you were a you know, sales guy. Sanjay, we seem to have lost you. The other day I was in uh, Surat. Sanjay, we're having a few network issues with your connection, I think. Uh, so there, there are a lot of architects doing uh, marketing, but we have never done it and we don't have any marketing people. I think when you do a good project, that in itself gives you so many more clients. But Sanjay, it takes a long time to get there to be recognized, you know. Until then, what? Who sells yeah. you? Who so, sells your talent? <laughs> Yeah, let me speak to that a little bit because we are yeah. a large organization and we are a big beast. It has to be fed. Uh, but I completely agree with Sanjay. We don't have, we see a lot of uh, architects having business development uh, individuals on the team. And even with our big behemoth, we do not have uh, business development individuals. So for uh, we, the practitioners, yes, talk to clients. Yes, we are performing that function. Uh, but your best business development uh, technique is your previous project. It's built. It's standing there. So 80% of our business is repeat business. If we do right by our clients the last time, they will come back to us. The second step that we, uh, so we uh, take great pride in the work we do, and we make sure that the work is done right. Not that, you know, we don't have bad projects. Everybody does now and then, but our focus is to get the job done right. The second piece is to get thought leadership out there. So what we are thinking, how we in, in four hours like this and others, uh, we, we get uh, our thinking out there. And, you know, then, but when the RFP does come in, there is a mechanic mechanics of uh, responding to all that. So for that, we do have marketing groups, but we do not have a business development group. And we, if we are able to do that at 5,500 people, the largest firm in terms of people and revenue, then I know that it's not necessary to focus that much on marketing and business development. Just do your job right. Akshat, would you like to add to that? Thinks. Well, I, I read somewhere that uh, if you do something, you need to talk about it. Um, and I think there's a lot of noise, especially in, uh, in India now with uh, publication, right? So there's a lot of that going on. Um, for the, I have to say that for, I, I think I agree with Smita again that your, your work and the personnel in your organization are your business development team, right? They are, the, they are, both are actually uh, torchbearers for what you do. Uh, and you need to often get thought leadership out there, um, which is what, you know, I guess now social media and publication does. Unfortunately, publication in India is not critical. It's only focused on uh, product or project delivery. And it's, a descript it's descriptive or, or celebratory, it's not critical. So it's, it's one dimensional. And I think clients understand that as well. Uh, I, for one, am not, we don't have a business development team and I, for one, am an introvert, so I don't network. Uh, um, I have, I have, uh, uh, I take solace in sort of going back and, and sitting amongst my instruments and playing them uh, rather than going out and partying or meeting other individuals. But yes, there are, I think most of the very successful practices out there have very, very aggressive business development teams. And uh, it's and I do believe that in India that is appreciated by clients, right? So uh, it's who you are, and uh, it's sorry, it's what you are and who you know here uh, to a large extent. So I think if it, they are a force multiplier because they are screaming out your message out, you know, at least the message of getting more business mm -hmm. or your availability out there. It's not only publications and not only PR firms, right? But various platforms like Smitha, you mentioned, even media opportunities and speaking opportunities, such as this, for example, this could become an opportunity for each one of you. Um, also awards and competitions, um, attending different things, whether it's, it's Pan India, whether it's international, just being visible creates that brand awareness, right? Now it's a question of whether you want to create that as an individual or do you want to create that as a company? 
And I think it kind of, it might work differently in both cases. So Sanjay, for example, your firm is pivoted on your name and on a person, right? Whereas Gensler, on the other hand, is a much larger sort of um, conglomeration, which is, you know, multiple people. And so it's not about knowing that one person who started it, mm-hmm. but as knowing Gensler as a brand. And Akshat, you're kind of sitting maybe, you know, if I can say so, in the middle of the two ends of the spectrum. So Sanjay, would you like to comment on that? No, no, you're absolutely right. But your your bio does sort of, you know, say that you've got gotten what more than 250 awards across the world. So that definitely says for something, right? Yes. So that that in itself is uh, yeah, being out there. But neither do we have marketing, and it's I think it's it's a project that gets you more projects. It happens with almost all projects. You do one good project and it actually multiplies and gives you at the very least five, six more. No, but I have to if say, Sanjay, really, I think, I think, uh, sorry. No, you. go ahead, Akshay. I think, I think you and Hafiz contractor and a couple of others are kind of phenomenons, you know, they're in, in India. Uh, you have been around for, you're like, you know, your, your forces to reckon with uh, in terms of your visibility and your, and the number of projects you do and the diversity of projects you guys do. No one can question it. Um, so you don't, I don't think it like Gensler, I don't think you really need to, Tell the world that you're there because everybody knows you're around. Come on, see, we, we are not that big, okay? You know, you guys are making us sound like God knows what. They're yes. like 70 people. They're not that many big. I mean, you're comparing to Hafiz who's got like 500 plus people. So it's not like that. And we are not doing some easy amount of work. We're just doing the kind of work that we can handle and we can take care of and it follows the principles of attention given to detail because you don't want to get that big that you don't know what is happening in the office. So you've kept it that way. So it's a conscious decision to not grow more than this? Yeah, it is actually a conscious decision so far. And at what point do you figure that, okay, you know, I want my studio to be this size and I want my practice Mm -hmm. to do only this kind of work. So, you know, especially for a lot of people who are starting their own studios and practices now, it's interesting to see because you might start off saying that, okay, let me do whatever comes my way, right? Because that's how you're going to get the, you set the ball rolling. But at what point are you able to define your own values for your own practice? At what point did you say, okay, this is what it's going to be? I think that understanding will come on its own. So at in the beginning, like in our case, we just took every single thing that came, okay? Literally every single thing. But now it's like, no, you don't want to do that Thing. You don't want to do this whole developer thing, and if the project has merit, excitement, then you do it. So you push to only get those kind of jobs, and the other ones you don't show so much interest in. So you've gradually done that whole shift. So you dis- you will realize yourself that there is this point that okay, as enough of doing everything because you know you cannot make a difference everywhere. Like let's be fair, you cannot in a standard developer project really make a difference, especially in Bombay with the kind of rules that there are. Okay, so you can only just make it kind of okay and nice. You can't do something that is wow because the rules don't permit you to do and the other conditions also don't permit you. So you don't want to do that anymore. So that the understanding I, comes. It'll come. I, w- I want Akshat and Smitha to respond to this and I want to come back to this mm. whole idea of catering and addressing the market versus yeah. doing what you actually want to do on your own. But uh, Smitha and Akshat, if you want to comment on what we talked about earlier. Uh, Akshat, you want to go first? Because I, I have a big answer here. We are, you know, we've gotten to 5,500. We're taking a slightly different approach, though all the constraints are the same. Yes. Go ahead, Akshat. I think, um, I mean, I, 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 would, I would respectfully disagree with Sanjay there. I, I think, A, we all have to define for ourselves what, what we mean by differentiator and what is significantly different enough to be a wow. Uh, B, I think all, at least uh, we like to believe that our work is rooted in being critical of the program and the typology in itself and take it on if you can be a differentiator, if you can contribute to being a differentiator in it. Only that way will there be a repeat for you, right? Uh, Here I'm not talking about the mechanism for delivery because the mechanism for delivery has to be unfallible or infallible, right? You have to do that. You have to deliver. It is the, you know, the understanding of a project from conception to completion 
is, uh, you know, it goes without saying. And the conception has to be that of a differentiator if you want to be heard, you know. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be heard. Uh, otherwise, you just need like a lot of numbers to just start coming your way. And that happens everywhere in the world. You have the numbers. Uh, there will be enough followers who will just sort of follow you. It's kind of like a conformist client or whatnot who will, who will sort of follow you in, in that way. Uh, so the only way we've been able to sort of make a mark for ourselves is by being, you know, distinctly different. Uh, and that's not different for the sake of being different. It's actually just making a critical contribution to the project. And you can see that from the, our client type, of, uh, our client profile as well. I mean, it, it, they will not, you really do have to go out and prove on paper and demonstrate that, you know, what your, you know, that, that differentiator is different because the, those, those clients and those projects, are, those project typologies already have a successful provenance. Akshay, do you feel that you started off in a certain way and therefore you, your, your trajectory has been like this? Or did you work towards making it so specifically defined? No, I think we were always like that. I think, I think, I think it, the stud, one of the core principles of the studio was critical intimacy. It was, okay. never, it was never critical dif dif difference. So um, it, it started like that. It was always about the space in between buildings more than the building in itself. I mean, that has to happen. You have to get your building right like a product or your interior right like a product. Uh, what did happen as we went along was we started doing a lot of interior work because uh, I think architectural uh, endeavors take fairly long, right? A any significant one will be three to five years. And sometimes they fall through the cracks. And suddenly, you know, so in the first seven years, we had only three projects built to show, but we'd worked on 20, you know, and they'd just fallen through the cracks. There was a recession and whatnot. And we realized we had to start embracing interior work because that would uh, A, give us opportunity to test things very quickly and uh, B, put uh, also hone our skills and C, make a network of projects that were, uh, you know, that were, that were good enough to show to people to say that, you know, we have delivered a certain scale, volume and quality of work. Yeah, so let me take that on. And I think for me, the answer is in both places. Uh, we've grown organically. So we didn't start out. If you ask Art today, which, you know, he comes to the office still, he's 85 years old. He comes to the office every day and you will run into him if you are in the uh, San, Fr uh, San Francisco office. So if anybody's coming, please let me know and I'll make sure you meet him. Uh, he didn't, you know, where we've ended up is not what we, what he envisioned. So the difference is it's the passion and the differentiator of a lot of individuals. So for instance, you know, we, absolutely, the, there is passion involved on what you're able to do with your client. So we embraced always, always we embraced our clients thinking and trying to solve the issue for them. Not that we did not question the brief, we expanded the brief, we made it. So we solved problems that the client doesn't know that they have or issues we we put a different light on a perspective and that that is the uh, that is part of the joy of what we are able to bring to the table but su suppose i was um, uh, passionate about consulting and strategy so i have been able to grow that business then there was somebody who was passionate about data centers so we do data centers completely different thing so this uh, issue i think what sanjay's uh, it's a, it's basically our uh, um, firm is a bunch of Sanjay studios. And there, there are a lot of people that they're not nearly as famous as, as Sanjay. We call ourselves the constellation of stars. So we, we don't have one sun, but we have a lot of stars who built studios around them, around their passions. And all of them are thinking the same way. They want to do something similar and we can just band together and increase the scale of our work and the scale of the impact. And really that's how it's built. So we, we find that a studio of about 35 is at the maximum. As soon as a group gets to be about 35 and 40 around an idea or an issue and or a practice, we usually break it up into two studios and then they start to grow again. And that's exactly how the firm has grown uh, on people's passions and also client relationships. So, for instance, if um, Chevron takes us to Houston, we go to Houston and then we start a business there. And that's that's sort of been our practice. And that's how we came to India as well. Uh, Smita, you've thrown up something very interesting here. So are you saying to all of us that you're a conglomerator of smaller studios that work independently? Um, for instance, uh, would you then 
take over Akshit's uh, practice or Sanjay's practice, not take over, but make them partners with Gensler to work out of India or work elsewhere. And is that how you've grown? So you are growing with other independent studios. Um, no, so we've never taken over a studio we do not acquire zero MNA activity for Gensler. We find okay. it doesn't work. not that we haven't tried. It just doesn't work for us. Uh, it's a very simple philosophy, but it is made up of studios and each studio is its own P and in fact every project is a PNL. So it, it's a team that can be made up of the best individuals from around the firm. We have that ability to uh, uh, attract the right people to make up a project, but they reside in a homeroom which is called the studio. And the project also belongs in a studio. So that's one um, sort of um, unit of um, organization. And several studios make an office and several offices make a region. So this is just a way of organizing uh, ourselves just so that there is some level of communication um, uh, and, uh, you know, just operational efficiency. But um, um, I'm just trying to, so, so we, I mean, I would love if Akshat wants to join a Gensler, then certainly we'll, we'll have a way to do it, but it's under the Gensler umbrella. And the most important thing for us is the Gensler culture, which absolutely transcends everything else. It's a one firm firm in the true sense that we put the firm or the benefit of the entire firm to get, you know, as much as the individual, it's employee owned. So every, all the profits are not going up to one person. Um, most of the 90% uh, of the profits go back to uh, employees. And, uh, you know, in, in these times right now, we are going through some uh, tough times um, financially. So the people who are uh, taken care of best are the most junior people. The principals are the ones who, which is about, I would say, 7%, 6% of the firm. We have taken the biggest cut but we take care of our people, it's they have shares in the firm. So it really is a collective rather than a conglomerate. I would mm. say it's a collective that everybody comes into this platform, works together and you know, sort of builds on each other's power. Thank you. So, um, I think I just want to come back to what Sanjay was talking about, what he mentioned a little uh, earlier. I know we're running way beyond time um, and Sanjay has another commitment. So we're going to quickly ask you, um, about this whole idea of responding to the market, what you were talking about earlier, right? And um, whether we should or whether we do this as a response to what is a requirement of the market versus what we want to do. And I know a lot of times you kind of get caught in between this, you know, it becomes like a conundrum of um, what we should do versus what we want to do, what is a requirement versus what is a desire and how we draw that balance between the two. And Sanjay, if we can get your thoughts on that and um, we will spare you for the rest of the evening. <laughs> no, I think you got me wrong in that, that last one. So it's mm -hmm. not about uh, doing what the market expects you to do ever. You never do what the market expects you to do. You do what you think is appropriate for that kind of thing. Yeah, some, some projects will be market driven. For example, everything is not an individual project and it's not a corporate project and it's not an education project. So there are uh, private developers projects, 90% of the architecture that happens in India, unfortunately, is that. But so given that there is a market condition for that particular plot in that part of the city, and there is a requirement for that, but you have to do whatever is possible in the best possible manner there. So is it such that if every good architect starts shunning all these developers, the developers will end up going to architects who are totally, which means that everybody will be living in a not so greatly designed apartment for the rest of their lives. You don't want to do that, right? So yes, so there are projects where you may not make an architectural wonder. Okay, That is what I was trying to say. But that does not mean that you can't make it better. You yes. have to make it better. So under all those circumstances of what the market desires, what the developer wants, you have to find a medial path and create the best kind of design solution that is possible on that particular plot for that particular location, considering the clientele that is going to come and live there. There is always something that you can do better. So we can't shun. Yeah. Right? 
I and agree. also the projects that are coming your way are determined by the market, right? I mean, there is a market for certain development and that's what is going to be available and is that is what is going to be offered to you. It's interesting that you you put it, um, you, you said something which almost seems like you're shouldering the responsibility of creating responsible architecture because mm-hmm. if you don't respond to it, then it, mm-hmm. these projects would go to people who perhaps would not be able to do justice to them. Absolutely. Do you know? And we all do. Past- I I agree with Sanjay. We all do. We should take this on. It's our you know, job. In the last seven eight years, how many residential towers have been created in Bombay, where kitchens kitchens don't get natural light and ventilation? Mm. Bathrooms are opening into two feet by five feet plumbing ducts. They have no natural yeah. ventilation. Do you think that works in India? No. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you make a curtain wall residential building where you can't open the window beyond six inches? <laughs> I mean, that's stupid to another level here. So this is what is happening everywhere in premium projects, in expensive apartments. If architects like us do not get involved, then that's what's going to happen. I mean, like blind aping of what's happening in the West in buildings which are not suited for the climate here. So it's refreshing to know that you're also, you know, the onus is being taken by the professional as well, right? It's not only by say, it's, you can't like shrug off responsibility and say that, oh, it's not coming to me or um, this is what is required of me. But there is a sense of wanting to expand on the awareness, whether it's with the client or the marketplace or the audience. Um, you know, so it's not only about the creator and the consumer, but it's also about the spectator in between. Exactly. So I'm going to ask you, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm getting uh, comments after comments on social media saying, why yes. is Sanjay not expanding internationally? Um, and why are you only stuck in India? So we had a lot of opportunities, but like you said, you know, so you were saying, right, success and whatever. So we, we had a project and Slabs of the first building. It was a very interesting project, complete sea view, sit, sitting on a site which was the first time we had a site which had an 80 degree slope. It was insane. It was literally like building against a wall. And all those complicated designs we did, project started, some investor backed out, and project stopped. In Dallas, we were about to start a project, everything done, contractor in place, permissions, and then the landlord had some problem and the project stalled. So, yeah, there is bad luck. Well, we hope, we wish you luck and we hope that we can see you expand and, you know, take over the world little by little. Uh, but I know that you have to run. So um, if, if everyone else is okay with it, we can take some more questions and carry on the conversation. And Sanjay, we can excuse you to have a more exciting Saturday night. If you can spare some more time and stay, stick around with us, of course, we'd love that. No, I have to go. I have to go. It's a function. Sure. But thank you so much for being thank here you. today. And uh, we we really hope to see a lot more of you and we will catch you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Hope to do this in person. Yes, soon. Bye, Akshat. Bye, Rajshri. Bye, bye, Sanjay. Thank you so much. See you. So Rajshri and I, that's what we were discussing. That's the only thing that has been um, rather unfortunate about this whole thing is that we can't actually sit in a room with a glass of yes. wine in our hands and have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, We're locked be behind digital screens instead. Uh, of course, Rajshri, you know, sort of case, case studies through, uh, through documentation or case studies through physical experiences are more than encouraged. They're actually mm-hmm. mandatory. Uh, you can't design a five-star hotel without knowing what, what is expected of you, right? Yeah. You can't. Uh, so... I, th- I think there is this, uh, this you know, the, 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 the thing is that over the last 20, 20 years, the performance criteria in architecture has gone up significantly. So we can't be, esot- and, and for the kind of clients that we're engaging with now, it's not random esoteric thoughts that you can have. I mean, there is, those are encouraged, but you do need to know what you, how things have to perform, how things have to work. Uh, so there isn't too much room for error. Right, and there is room. There is tremendous room for experimentation, uh, but that experimentation and prototyping happens on the drawing board within a workshop, you know, through a through a through a three D printed model, through a physical model, or any such thing, uh, through simulation software, but uh, and even through a basic diagram or a, or a drawing uh, and your thought process. But it's 
you know it's it's on a lower performance scale that you can afford to not have experience but if i was to say today i mean we do we are fortunate enough we're doing a lot of public work for uh, for a for a community of people or a lot of community that actually can't afford us unless the government hires us or unless it is through the through a community engagement even there the performance criteria may not be as precise as that of a very fancy hotel or a or a or a or a wealthy person's home but it's a performance criteria now that has to say every 10 rupees matters on this project because it has to be stretched for the next 25 years and it has to perform because this person will not have the ability to maintain it in the same manner as someone else so there are different levels of that right and you can't afford to to uh to let the ball to drop the ball in a big way and i think that that's that's actually where i accept what sanjay and smita both said that if you don't do it if you don't stick your neck out and do it yourself someone else is going to do it badly right and we see those examples around us all the time uh it's actually when we realized that we were performing well at the highest level that we said okay can we be a bit like robin hood and start giving back to the masses right because we never nobody starts out saying oh i want to make the fanciest rich home or i want to make mm-hmm. the fanciest five star hotel you mm-hmm. start out with saying you know you want to do work for for regular people people that you can relate yeah. to yourself yeah um and then and and it's never meant i mean the the entire organizational structure that of a contract that of a you know of a of a financial uh, uh, arrangement and all is just to supplement good architecture and your and, yeah. and the ability to run the studio we also whenever we can encourage um, you know sort of cpds uh, we'll send someone out be it abroad be it uh, out of station or what not to do a short program do a short course do a short sort of experience it's it's a way of giving back that is more i mean you know sort of thanking someone uh, who's who's who's, who's a few people or a person who's worked in the studio long enough or worked well and it's not never seen as it, it's not a contracted thing i know that often people say well it's a contract you you go study and we sponsor your study and you come back and you work with us no none, none of that just mm-hmm. hey you know you've done a good job we can always give you a check as a bonus but you know let's just try mm-hmm. and think about you for a while it's and, also an uh, incentive right it's an incentive to to experience and grow i mean i believe growth, i've been yeah, fortunate yeah incentive for growth yes yeah, yeah. which I, is important I, yes i i mean i believe i've been fortunate and and i would yeah. like to pass that on right I, it's not uh, whatever we are we are and, and and i mean we're happy to be where we are uh, after 12 13 years of and i mean value added the life of an individual in their career path and i think that's amazing in itself and i mean at the end of it all they are the assets of your 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 practice So and yeah, you have to nurture those assets. And in fact in lines of this we got another question from social media which talks about um you know what is the what is the importance of qualifications when you're hiring people. So of course you're looking at passion and you're looking at their potential in terms of their personality but are you going for somebody who is going to be highly qualified in terms of certification um or is that something that you know you're willing to sort of negotiate with them during uh, their time working with you? or is that is there like a hard fast rule what is that and i'm sure it'll be different it's different you know based on in context and based on uh, the location that you're in as well so if you could comment on those you know there are certain basics there is no question when you see certain qualifications because behind qualifications is an assumption of basic competence i think that's what you're looking at and that's why we seldom hire just on a resume you look at the portfolio and mm-hmm. you see the arc of development and then meet for us culture is absolutely everything because we are a team sport player if a person is collaborative plus we can see the fire in their belly to do more and better that's who we hire if and i think sanjay said that and akshat said that tools can be taught it's the attitude that cannot be taught if and you got to hire for the right attitude uh qualifications you know um so this is my own personal experience we've hired great architects and i worked with um architects or people who've trained at harvard and i have trained with people who don't even have an architectural degree and many times the a person who doesn't have the architecture degree in a particular area 
is far better than the person who went to Harvard. And this is my own personal experience. So I take the uh, qualifications on a piece of paper with a pinch of salt. All the other things have to be there. Uh, but you are looking for some basic competence and I guess the qualifications, um, um, you know, apply only for that. Uh, just sure. to let you know, one of our best site people is not even an architect, but I would stake my life on him. But he came with a referral and he's, you know, uh, through our experience, he's proved himself. So yes, now it doesn't matter. And I think that's, that's more true now than ever yeah. because, yeah. you know, yeah, lines are kind of blurring and blurring, getting yeah. a lot more fluid. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Rajshri is not a designer or an architect. She's not yeah. professionally from this field, but it's because of her um, sort of interest and passion mm -hmm. yeah, she that she tremendous. continues to propagate and, you know, encourage people in this field. And um, on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, I'm a trained architect, but I'm not practicing anymore. And it's so we kind of, yeah. you know, we, we kind of find our own ways. And sometimes we discover, sometimes we, we don't find it and we continue to discover. But it's becoming more and more possible to do these things now because, you know, people are becoming more accepting of it as well. Also, yes. Mrinalini, I think uh, we'll have to tell the audience here and, and Darshat and uh, that the next conversation we are having on IDF architecture debates is on professional training versus education. And this is precisely what you mentioned. Thank you for bringing it up. And, um, you know, um, they're all important. Sometimes one more than the other, you know, as you, you experience. So, Watch, watch for tune in for the next session as well. Yeah, I think if you guys can, will permit, then we have a couple more questions to pick up. Um, if you're not tight on time, Akshat and Smita. Yeah, sure, go on. I, yeah. yeah, I can see. Okay, so I'm not sure who this question is aimed towards, but Soumya Jen on social media is asking that I agree that your past projects are your biggest business development tools, but what do you do if your firm is fighting misconceptions? I'm not sure what these, so in brackets, she says commercial, expensive, or international. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, I'll let you take that. <laughs> so I, I'll start with that. Um, I think you have to show up. You have to talk. And for us, the people who go for the quote unquote pitch or for that initial meeting are the people who are going to stay with the project throughout. And you have to see if you can connect as people. Because in the end, people will be working on the project. There is no company that's going to come come on come and work on the project. Um, that's what you do. And if you can make that personal connect beyond that, because we are all of that. We are international. We are commercial. You know that that label, and we're expensive. But we know that we can deliver the right solution. So I think that's what you try and do. Okay. Thank you. Um, Akshay, do you want to add to that? Commercial, no, I, expensive, I, international. I actually, I, I, I didn't understand the question, but I, I can, I think if the question is how can you break the shackles and sort of and 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 move in a different direction or, uh, or such, then yes, you can. You started out from nothing and you are somewhere, and then if you need to if you need to change direction or, then you basically have to go back. Uh, not you don't have to go back to zero or square one, but you have to you have to just step take a step back and say, well, you know, this is the paradigm that that I that I succeeded in, and mm -hmm. I would like to now uh, I would like to now diversify, and that's a, that's a you know it's an attitudinal thing more than a a commercial expectation. You could uh, go to the extent of doing a project for free, you know, if you if you have to to demonstrate your ability to to do so. And that's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just uh, creating provenance for yourself. It's interesting. I think Sanjay also talked about this and he's, he's actually mentioned this in, in some of his uh, previous in, uh, interviews where he says that he had to move away from this whole development sort of uh, pigeonhole that he got caught in. And he had to redefine his practice to be doing a lot of other diverse works. Um, and it's interesting that you bring in this idea of doing free work because we have another question from Vibhuti Katpalya, who says that what is the situation of pro bono work for government in India? Uh, do architects prefer it? If yes, then why? And is it easy working with the Indian government? I have never a tough time working with the Indian government. Yeah. Actually, but you're not allowed I, to do I, pro bono work. Sorry? Yeah. I, you know, we, 
I w- I personally was very keen on contributing to the rail uh, railway design uh, piece and w- willing to do pro bono because we never win on a fee proposal. Uh, to a certain extent, we were willing to do pro bono, but you're right, we, there was no avenue to do that. Uh, also remember that you have to have, I mean, A, when you're doing pro bono work, is it an unfair trade practice? I think that's a conversation mm. that one should have. Like, is it an unfair trade practice? And it, so you can do subsidized work, right? If, if subsidized work is given to is being done by a professional organization or individual that is qualified and capable and will do the best possible is the best person for the job, then there's nothing wrong with it. I think the issue mm-hmm. of um, you know the, the issue becomes murkier when the project goes to someone who is not necessarily the best person for the job. Right? But isn't uh, that subjective? Who's to decide whether the person is, is appropriate listen, the, or not? Unfortunately, now there is a very there is there is a very clear technical definition, right? Mm-hmm. Tech, you know, you have to if if I wanted to work for say the railways or if I wanted the pro, the parliament project, I have to have the wherewithal to guarantee that I can deliver it, right? You're gonna have to give your guarantee. That's just your, logistics, no, Akshat. Yes. That, that is yours. You're still addressing just the logistic part of it, saying that okay, you are a firm with X number of people, you have the capability of mm-hmm. doing X number of you know, work in X number of time, but do you have the ability to deliver an ability of thought and practice to deliver what is required of the project? Isn't that the subjective part of it? Well, look, you have the capability. That's how you have the provenance. Um, That's how you've done it all these years. That's why you've got there. That's why you've got to a point where you could do it. Hmm. Yeah, the right. ability, the quality, I think you're addressing the qualitative nature of that. And that is all that it can be subjective, certainly. But the basics have to be met, which is what Akshit is saying, your provenance is your capability, sure. that you've been able to do it. And then after that, it is subjective. And you, you know, what, what are you going to do about that? It's, it is subjective. Somebody, uh, you know, a, a government official may see, oh, yeah, somebody was able to make the four walls stand up and it's functioning and that may be adequate. They may not see the, ad, uh, the added value of added good design, value, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Also, I think, may I add, that the public tendering process in India, which is the, you know, the lowest bidder norm for government contracts, I think that kind of is a bit of a, a stumbling block for really good work to, to be executed, you know. I know Niti Aayog is trying to change that whole norm. I'm not quite updated on what exactly they've been able to achieve so far. Wouldn't you agree, Akshat? That is a bit of a limiting factor. He's for, on mute. Yeah. He's on mute if somebody yourself. can unmute him. You, you know, recently, uh, Rajshree, I've seen uh, some things with 70% technical marks and 30% commercial marks. Okay, which helps that uh, firms like us still don't qualify, but I think it, that, that's a move in the right direction. Then it's not yeah. everything is not based on the lowest common uh, lowest. Yeah, bidder. yeah. I, I think I think that changed a while ago. It's not just the lowest bidder. It's uh, but a there is always there has to be a technical prov- a provenance for you to get a project. So while it may sort of feel like you're trampling on a lot of ambition. It's not just in India. I mean, I take you back to the Reichstag project that, that Tom and Foster finally did the Dome for, yeah. but it was rumored that Calatrava was the one who won the competition, right? It was oh. India, Calatrava. But, yeah. And then it goes on to, and, and if you were to sort of draw that analogy, and I know I'm being politically incorrect here, but when you look at what Santia, how delayed and how over budget Santiago Calatrava's project for, uh, for, for the, you know, for the underground station at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at ground zero was at New York, then it just goes to prove a point. So uh, the same applies for, you know, there was a rumor that it was a student from the architecture association that designed the dome, the, the, the vaulted roof over the British Museum Library, but it actually went to Foster and Partners that time. And Foster Partners actually sort of revived themselves because they suddenly won two, three prestigious uh, commissions then. But the, and that brings me to the point that a studio has to deliver Right yeah, today, your architectural endeavors are far too, uh, you know, too delicate and too or too too prestigious and too significant to be entrusted onto some onto a system or a or a studio that has not proven themselves. It may sound wrong, you know, but it's unfortunately the truth. It is too expensive. It's too precious. You know, our cities are important, and. 
while they may find a way to sort of get collaboration, you know, like if you look at say the Nalanda project or any such, you will see that there are studios that have proven themselves internationally uh, collaborating with studios that are from India to do a certain typology of work. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, oh. again, I think the architecture is, you know, one of those fabulous things that has to function. So it has to be built, it has to not leak. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I will not hire Peter Eisenman. I'm sorry, um, this should not, I'm sorry, I'm on uh, social media, but his <laughs> buildings leak. So, you know, you, you have to partner with the person who's going to make sure that this thing stands up. It has to, it has to, it has to first emote and then it has to perform. You can't just stop it emoting. Right? You have to make it perform. Mm, it can't be just um, about that. Yeah. So I'm going to go on to a couple of uh, fascinating questions. We actually have people who are, Smitha, you, you opened the floodgates because now we've got people who are actually requesting for jobs and are literally <laughs> sending their portfolios into us on chat. <laughs> on um, so I'm going to refrain from that for now. But um, I would like to ask Akshat, sir, what your perspective for students while creating concept and vision for their thesis projects would be. Uh, can you give us some tips on doing a portfolio? What actually do firms expect? This is Madan from Insta. So, well, now you'll just be talking about how to apply to each of your firms. <laughs> be, be yourself. Yeah. Be, be, yeah, be, I, be, be concise and be yourself. That's it, you know. And, you know, go beyond the surface. That's what I would say. What really interests you pick something that really interests you. Don't, don't ask that question, what do firms expect of you? Firms expect all of you, your authentic self. And each one and of we can see offers it. something different. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it's not about being a cookie cutter sort of template. Right. Right. So, I'm sorry, but um, um, uh, Amit has written a question, has written something yes. to me, a comment to say that, uh, Araksha, that would not encourage newness, newness and encourage a continuation of established firms only, which I think he's referring to my previous conversation. Mm -hmm. um, look, understand that I think it's, it's not about, architecture is not about only newness, right? Like I said, it has to first emote and then perform. We've, we are not at a point where architecture can only emote and I mean, or you emote over a few pieces of paper and a model and not deliver. So you have to tie up with the delivery making mechanism. The reason why our cities are in shambles is because they have not, I'm not saying I cannot absolve my uh, predecessors or, or you know, larger firms in India of, or across the world of having missed an opportunity. Of course they have, but that doesn't mean, uh, and, but the, and that doesn't mean we continue that. Uh, there is always gonna be a quest for good architecture and good, you know, good design good delivery systems and we have to continually improve. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's only new studios that can do good work or new studios that can reinvent themselves. There was someone who asked us a question for reinvention just a short while ago. Go into the history of studios such as, well, hey, look at Richard Rogers partnership pre the Welsh assembly and look at them now. Right? Like look at Richard Rogers partnership as just that and then look at Rogers Turk Harbor, right? Look at the, 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 the history of the studio. So it's not like established studios cannot evolve and do something significantly different, they do. It's just that when they're delivering things that are not broken, they're not sort of completely trashing them out. They're just waiting on something else to happen. That's, that's research. And, and so, frankly, newness for the sake of newness, I've never, is, you know, yeah. uh, the plazas uh, in our old cities are fabulous. Mm -hmm. we, if we cannot do it better than that, then let's stick with that. So yeah. newness for the sake of newness doesn't make any sense to me. We were having this conversation internally about the future of cities and we're doing a bunch of research and putting uh, some ideas together. And we realized that the future of the cities, may, the future city may look very much like the city of the past because yeah. there were some things that worked so well. Mm -hmm. And in, in the sake or in the uh, pursuit for newness, sometimes we lost that and we need to reclaim that. Well, also, also Mr. Say, um, yeah. go ahead, Akshit, sorry. Uh, I also think that when I think when we look at uh, architectural endeavors in the public realm, then there is a lot of responsibility. I mean, it is it's fine to engage uh, 
you know it's probably okay to engage at smaller scale or with uh, with individual or even smaller organizations or well organization of any scale when it's not public money but the moment you are engaging in the public realm there is a certain there is a weight to that engagement because now public space has to it's not okay for public space to last only 10 years public space has to perform for 50 years 100 years those are the ones that you and uh, uh, that you and us embrace those are the ones that we remember right if you look at central uh, vista or central delhi now it's 100 years old it survived that time there was a certain dev, and 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 they were you know at the time that uh, latin and baker were delivering that charles jane mackintosh was doing the mackintosh school right like look at what was really happening like kobuzia was just about getting into uh, doing the first domino right uh, so look at that you know that there is that shift uh, but it, it was interested because it has to survive uh, i i think um it's it's few and far between that you will see uh, young like absolutely fresh out people deliver and by the way the the, the international sort of standard and we were having this conversation earlier for a young architect is 45 years right you That's need right. to have graduated and have done something for a certain amount of years and then you're still young at 45 right. so i'm That's i'm exactly young. right <laughs> I, I like how you are uh, a baby. Your your by the way, your standards have gone from forty to forty five within a span of an hour. Uh, in, internationally, <laughs> internationally is forty five. In India, thirty five. <laughs> so by and, India standards, and, you're old and you're done with. <laughs> no, it, it, it's well, whatever the standards are, they're established by publication, right? I think I think we were having that conversation earlier also yeah. about publication and awards and whatnot. Yes. But yes. I forgot to say that I, I, you know there was a time when there were only so few, and today there are so many. Yeah, and you know, and so we, how do you pick? And well, anyway, that's a conversation another day. Um, I we actually have a lot of younger sort of um, uh, audience that are coming out of school and are wanting to establish their own practices. So we're getting a lot of comments and questions from them. And someone asks about this whole idea of innovation, right? Where, uh, especially as a new architect or a new professional, you are you feel the pressure to innovate to prove yourself, and by innovate you. more often than not we're talking about an original idea or again coming back to the idea of, of doing something new so how do you overcome that and how do you again when you're starting off on your own how do you did you go through this process where you had to pick projects that were coming your way so that you could earn the money to sustain your practice and then sort of do works on the other end that were not necessarily paying but would um, sort of satiate your or indulge or you would be able to indulge in your curiosities smitha <laughs> well i didn't go that route so for me it was very important to build a foundation mm-hmm. and i uh, since i was uh, trained here i didn't have that opportunity to go out and put my placard uh, out there not that i was uh, tempted to do that here we finish school uh, in the us and then we have to go through uh, the registration yes. architectural registration which takes um, you know there's a period of apprenticeship which i completely believed in and by the time i you know went through that period i found that i'm much better as a part of a collective and um, you know once i found a sort of a spiritual home i did not have this temptation to put smitha gupta architect out there because i felt i can do it as part of the firms that i was uh, participate i was learning so much that i did not have that temptation and to this day now i could but i don't have that temptation because i i think uh, i what i can contribute i do much better as part of a team mm-hmm. than as me individually and if i can bring all my ideas to that and that they shape the project in the right way only the good ones will survive so the best ideas can come from many different places it takes professionals and experienced professionals to pluck the right idea and put it in the right place in the right proportion and that's why akshat's right at 45 years or with that much uh, experience behind you that's when you know what is a good idea because newness for newness sake i just said is an innovation if it is not really making something better it's just uh, it's just a um it's a it's folly pointless. it's an architectural yeah. folly so akshat i think you've been d- down this road so you can maybe answer it more directly look i i think i think i had a good fortune of being of working for a few very very good architects at a younger at my in, in at a young age 
So I first worked with Kanor and Prasad. Then I worked with, and I had zero experience of a studio before I went abroad. So I never made this, I never did the one month internships or sort of mm -hmm. trips to architecture studios. I, I was sort of, because that one month I'd rather spend sort of playing the guitar. And I actually encourage people to that, like travel, you know, experience the world, experience yes. your country. You don't have to just be a one trick pony, sort of stick in there and sort of mm -hmm. learn some new architectural skill. I, I think that just sort of destroys it all. Um, the second is, I think, I think don't succumb to some sort of financial pressure because trust me, the, the entrepreneurial journey is not a pleasant one and it's fraught with danger. So you'd much rather have that safe but lower earning architect's job, which is at least teaching you, right? So therein it becomes important to choose the studios that you want to work with and be sort of dogged about it and be committed. Um, so you have to sort of spend at least three to four to five, three to five years to sort of understand studios and you need to go through a couple of scales of work uh, over a few years. Um, and a significant number of years before you can, before you really have a voice, right? Um, a significant enough voice. Um, if you even look at Corbusier's earlier works and go up, go back in the book, see what he was doing for the first 15 years of his life. It was just, he Poussard. was just, just, just copying what was already, or just repeating what was, it was repetition. It was learning through repetition. So, and that's also the old saying, right? A good copy is better than a bad invention, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you go, so you go down that path. Um, and finally, for me, because I had worked with A, with Pradhan Prasad and then with Jeff, and then finally, when I came to India, I was very, for a very short, brief period of time, actually just about two months, I tried a commercial firm that's called Morphogenesis, which I, I didn't think I fit in. And then I, uh, I you know, then, then, then I started working with Viren, which was about four years. So I think I cut my teeth, uh, I cut my professional teeth with Viren and he was my guinea pig or I was his guinea pig, whatever, we, we, we still debate that. But I was a reluctant starter, right? And that's why it's not, you know, Atelier Akshat Bhatt or whatever. That's why it's architecture discipline because I always wanted the studio to be beyond me, uh, which by the way, I'm, I'm, I, can, I, can, I can happily say over the last year or so, whenever I've gone out, people have heard of the studio, but they haven't heard of me. Mm -hmm. and I have to say, oh, you know, but I found, so I have to sort of use the studio name and the provenance for myself. You know, I founded it, uh, which is, which is nice to, to have, to, you know, to have got to a certain point with, but, you know, I would really, really resist and discourage people from starting out on their own early on. Start out when you you know, you're, when you're, when you, when you've done when you, you know, when you sort of learned it, when you're critical enough with your contribution, this, and do not innovate. I mean, we really, really <laughs> resist innovation. We want to, it's just for the sake of it, right? We look, we are critical of what a program is doing. We're critical of what a, a typology or a morphology is doing to try and make it achieve more. But you have to first understand what is achieving before you can make it achieve more, right? If you don't understand it, then how can you do it? Yeah. And that's I, why I, case studies yeah. are important, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 but you can't just do it through case studies because you don't know what that wall section is. You don't know how it's going to perform. Mm. You, you know, unfortunately in India, we pay very little importance to the physics of building. Yes. Right. Building physics as a science, you need to know it. And unless you know that you can't deliver it, it's not just about fancy shapes and, and, and expensive material, you know, architecture is about, a lot more than that. It has to move the human spirit, but it also has to give you health and safety. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because now with the technological tools, we feel that we can design anything. You get into a computer and you can go into that maze. You can build anything on uh, uh, in the uh, virtual world, but that is not architecture. That's You can do that for gaming organization. If, if that's your predilection, become, uh, you know, a game designer or do the graphics for them. For architecture, it has to be at the right scale. How does the human body, how does the human spirit react to this built thing? It's really important. I, Akshat, I could not agree more. Do not innov innovate. Do not start your own practice unless that's the only thing that you can do. You know, artists say that. They are doing what they're doing because they just can't conceive of anything else. There's so much inside them that just comes out. And that's exactly when you should start your own practice and give yourself 
at least five years to learn the basics and have somebody good teach you. I think the US model of doing the registration uh, and going through that apprenticeship model is a really good one and perhaps India should consider that. Because really, you're not an architect when you come out of school. You're barely, you're barely ready to become an architect. Agreed. And if I could just uh, add to what Akshat and Stubthu are saying, is that it's important to experiment and work in different environments, and not only to necessarily understand what you want to do, but it sometimes also helps you understand what you don't want to do. And I think that becomes mm -hmm. critical as well. Um, you know, you might want to work in different, and it could be something as um, you know, as small as how big an office do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a part of a Gensler or do you want to be a part of an architecture discipline? Because they're two very different work environments. Do you want to do residential work or do you want to do other kinds of work? Everyone's doing different works with different ethics and different values. And the more you experiment, and I'm not saying, you know, hop from job to job, give yourself that kind of opportunity and the time that it requires to assimilate into a space but experiment and you know what better than to do it at somebody else's cost and time right <laughs> look here in, in our studio it takes about six months to learn how to draw and how to work on our server systems right i mean it's yeah. it to to really sort of get conversant with it including the uh, including how to how to send communication out to a site or to a client you know how to check your own drawings before you actually plot them out and mm -hmm. and have somebody else check them uh, you know there is a lot of responsibility I think people don't understand or or undermine the need for insurances for professional liabilities, etc. Um, it's coming into place now in India. It's becoming mandatory. Uh, and I, like I said, innovation for the sake of it. I, I remember I actually made a trip uh, to a city, to a big city in in India, because I had read and heard so much about a few parametrically sort of done projects I was, it was it really interested me and of course it you know the the the, the 3d models and the and the, the 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 aesthetic of the project is just so striking you know so i said well okay this city's got three let me go see so i actually went i took four days out went to see these and i came back and asked my thesis tutor who I, you know i still speak to and i said you know it i don't know it just felt like a glorified shed what was it? And, you know, that's when he started explaining to me that, look, you, you must understand that it's just someone's taken a very simple thing and uh, simple objective and complicated it. And with architecture is not about that. It's about a simplistic representation of something that is complex, of a complex mm -hmm. program. If you can achieve that with just a single clear flow plate, which is a, which is a warehouse shed, do it. Uh, why, why stop yourself? Because that's the most effective, efficient way of doing it. I think we forget all of that in architecture in, in 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 the need to sort of call ourselves out as different and in the need to innovate and that is that is a very dangerous trend and that is why we see publication out of publication today in india of architectural masterpieces so to speak but look at what our cities are like yeah couldn't agree more um interestingly what's happening now is that uh, like organically our conversation is melding into what would technically be our next conversation yes, which is, which is yes. next saturday yes. so, and like rajshri mentioned we are going to be talking about this whole idea of architectural education versus professional yeah. training and you know what happens in school and what happens on the field um how one can complement the other and whether it is happening or not and we're getting a lot of questions based on that so I'm going to ask um, our audience to kind of tune in next week, please, on the 12th of December again at 6 p.m. We've got a very interesting lineup of speakers. We've got Amrish Narora, uh, Riaz Tayyabji, and Vicky uh, Richardson, who's going to be, um, they're going to be discussing this topic. Um, but I, and I'm going to have to cut things short now, given that we're uh, over two hours. And we've got <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, it didn't feel like that. Yeah, yeah. the sun's <laughs> come out. I'm sure oh, my yeah. lighting got better. <laughs> Yes, but so I'm just to so make you uh, make you all happy. I've got Amit Singh saying thanks. This is refreshing, and have a great Saturday night. So I wish you all a great Saturday night, and uh, you know, uh, let's end with uh, what one of you said, which was architecture has to move the human spirit, and that I think is the most important thing at the end of it all. And um, you've all been so amazing. 
And, um, uh, you know, we have so much to thank uh, our outreach partner, Established Communication, Media Partner, Design, and Design Pataki, and, of course, all you amazing speakers. Smita, all the way from San Diego. I hope you can go back and crawl into <laughs> bed now. And Akshat um, and Sanjay, and uh, from Brinalini and me, a big thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to add that we have a small team that's working with us to make everything possible. Uh, so we have the IDF team, Meher and Nisha, and we also have Namita, who is taking care of all our back-end and logistics for the day, um, entered by Siddhant. So thank you all. Um, and of course, like Rajshri said, everybody across, we've, we've had people tune in from across the world on hmm. uh, Facebook, on Instagram, on Zoom. And uh, we're very grateful to be able to have these conversations and to make them, uh, you know, approachable and accessible to each one and everyone um, across the platform. And thank you so much for sparing your uh, Saturday night, Akshat and Sanjay, and your, I don't know, Friday, well, Saturday early morning, <laughs> Friday Saturday. night, somewhere in the middle of, of nowhere, <laughs> Smita. But thank you all so much. Uh, please it's tune in again. And um, for, you know, and honestly, for people who have more questions for our speakers, feel free to write into us on our um, on the IDF or our personal yeah. uh, social media handles and we'll try to forward them to Akshat. Yeah. We'll spare them the sort of influx of job applications. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I'm sure, you know, it's interesting because people are applying to Gensler and Gensler is trying to poach Akshat. So there's some interesting <laughs> dynamics happening over here. Uh -huh. and, uh, we are I'm, I'm glad that we are, we are being able to facilitate this. If nothing else, a lot of, you know, we're opening a new market. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and good night everyone thank, thank you, you. Have a thank you so much and thank Akshat you. call me Akshat just write to me thank you bye bye which, which bye means bye. there's an opening in architecture discipline I'm out of a job so <laughs> oh, good. see you guys have a good bye. night yeah, have a bye good bye night. thank you so much bye